Next, Moses is reunited with his wife. At some point during the plagues when things got tough, Moses sent Zipporah and their sons back to Midian for their own safety. Presumably. So now, uh, Zipporah's father Jethro is bringing them back to Moses. Jethro, who's a priest of Midian, praises the God of Israel for what he has done. He professes faith in the God of Israel as greater than all other gods. And Jethro has some surprising words of wisdom for Moses. <clears throat> Stop working so hard. Look at you. You've completely worn yourself out. Looks like you've been stressed these last few months. You know, you shouldn't be afraid to delegate. All Israel has just started learning to keep the Sabbath rest. But Moses himself, yeah, he's had a stressful last few months. And he's still having trouble with the whole work-life balance. He personally has been trying to keep everyone happy and solve every problem in camp, and he can't do it. Jethro urges him to set up a formal court system with lower courts and higher courts and a court of appeal, and you're the one-man supreme court. Do it. And Moses does. When God gives us a task that seems too big for us, maybe that's because it is. Don't be afraid to delegate. Ask other people for help. And let them in on what God's doing. Then three months after leaving Egypt, the Israelites reach Mount Sinai. God speaks to Moses and proposes a covenant with Israel. He says, If you obey my voice and keep my commandment, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The elders of the people agree. What did they just agree to? Well, they agreed to obey God and worship him alone. And in response, God will do great things with them. He will make them holy. He will give them his commandments and teach them to walk in his ways. He will make them all priests. At this point in history, all the firstborn sons are the priests in Israel. This was explained in the fine print of the Passover ritual from last week's reading. Now, God says he will make all his people priestly mediators, a kingdom of missionaries who will bring the whole world to him. <coughs> this is the covenant God proposes. This is the covenant God makes. <clears throat> this is the high point of the entire Pentateuch. The covenant, the commandments, and the adoption of all Israel as priest, prophet, king, and firstborn son. What you need to know right now to make sense of everything that's going to happen is the covenant fails. This covenant is plan A. It is broken almost as soon as it is made when Israel worships the golden calf. Next week, we'll see God will renegotiate the covenant with Moses, plan B, but it won't be quite as good. God will still teach Israel his commandments, but they lose their role as that kingdom of priests. It's only with the coming of Jesus the firstborn of all creation and the great high priest, that, God, that all of God's people are once again called a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood in the words of St. Peter. We, the church, are now the children of God who bring the world close to God. But God, here and now, and by here and now I mean you know 3,300 years ago, proposes this great covenant to the people of Israel. I want you to be my children. I want you to do great things for me. And he tells them to prepare for it. Wash their clothes, abstain from sex, and do not approach the holy mountain. It is a good thing when we prepare ourselves to receive God. <coughs> we do that ritually in Advent and Lent. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. We do that by praying before Mass. And we do that by placing ourselves in the presence of God whenever we pray, taking a moment to remember who it is that we're speaking to. The people prepare to receive God. And God appears, wreathed in smoke, blazing in fire on the mountaintop with a sound of trumpet blasts. The trumpets get louder and louder. The earth shakes mightily, and the voice of God sounds like thunder. And the Lord calls Moses to go up the mountain into the smoke and the fire and the thick darkness. And when Moses reaches the top, God says, you need to go back down again. God explains that the people 
are not doing what Moses told them to do, and they're trying to rush the mountain. And they really shouldn't do that. So Moses goes back down the mountain and tells everyone to stay put. Then God speaks the Ten Commandments. It sounds like he doesn't wait for Moses to come back up the mountain. It sounds like he announces them in his great booming voice to everyone. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no graven images. Number two, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Number three, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Number four, honor your father and mother. Number five, you shall not kill. Number six, you shall not commit adultery. Number seven, you shall not steal. Number eight, you shall not bear false witness. Number nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And number ten, you shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. And that's a very fair point. You shall not murder. For example, there's, there's no prohibition against, say, killing a lamb in sacrifice. Or killing in war. Or killing in war. Again, there's going to be a lot more that can be said about that later on morally, but yes. The, uh, the implication is thou shalt not murder. All right, so here's a question for you. Are these Ten Commandments still binding for us? Yes. Supposed to be. They're supposed to be. Yes. Traditionally, Catholic moral teaching not only upholds the Ten Commandments, but uses them as an, a framework to hang the entire moral law on. When you're teaching the catechism, whether to adults or children, you teach the moral law by going through the Ten Commandments one by one and uh, listing how we are supposed to live. What is the best way to live? At great length. Um, think of how Jesus taught. Moses says, thou shalt not kill, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. So thou shalt not kill doesn't just mean that. It means everything related to that. That's the way, the catech that's the way Jesus treats it. That's the way the catechism treats it. And I took one example from the catechism to give you the idea. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no graven images. What does the catechism have to say about that? Plenty. We owe God worship, prayer, and sacrifice. The sacrifice of our lives. We bring ourselves to him. We must not commit <clears throat> heresy, apostasy, schism, despair, presumption, indifference, ingratitude, lukewarmness, Acadia or spiritual sloth, hatred of God, superstition, idolatry, divination, magic, sacrilege, atheism or agnosticism. It goes off on how religion is good for public life and how freedom of religion is good. What about graven images? Idols are still prohibited. But the Seventh Ecumenical Council back in 787 decided that sacred images became permissible upon the coming of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That kind of shattered that prohibition once and for all. Now, for us Christians, icons of Jesus, Mary, and the saints are a great way to pray. Statues of the saints inspire piety, and even Protestants have picture Bibles with Jesus in them. Now, we could go through this with all Ten Commandments, but we'll do that with the Catechism class this spring. Here's another question. How do we know which parts of the Law of Moses are still binding on Christians and which are not? Now, the moral law is still intact, and anything to do with the sacrificing of the temple, food kind of preparation are all null and void. You're good. All right, three different kinds of law. I'll write them down. Moral, civil, and ceremonial. The ceremonial laws, I'm sorry, yeah, the ceremonial laws describe ritual worship. We will get into those next week. We're not touching them tonight. The civil laws are pretty easy to identify because they have specific penalties attached to them. It's something like if, if, an, if an ox gores a man and kills him, then the owner of the ox will not be held responsible, but the ox shall be put to death. You know, it's got all these very specific provisions for if such and such a thing happens, 
here's the penalty, here's the way to deal with it. That's the civil law. And the civil law, like James said, it's got, all these, it's got all these penalties and prescriptions attached to it. So these laws are to regulate the community. You know, they're the equivalent of, you know, the speed limit. They're the laws you have to keep to keep order in society. Now, the civil laws and the ceremonial laws are provisional and imperfect. Jesus makes this very clear. Jesus transcends the ceremonial law. Think about how he takes the Passover meal and completely changes it into the Eucharist. Think about the disciples walking through a wheat field, eating heads of wheat on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees go, mm, you're picking grain on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, yes, just like David did. Jesus transcends the civil law. He walks up to the woman caught in the act of adultery and says, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. And they all look at him drop their stones and walk away. The penalty is that people who commit adultery should be put to death. Jesus is releasing her from the penalty. He can do that. And also, this is civil law. Well, Jesus is also forgiving her sin. Now we have come to the moral law. The moral law stands forever. And Jesus says, whoever teaches one of these little ones to sin, it is better if you were to have a millstone put around his neck and be thrown into the sea. The ceremonial and the civil law were provisional and temporary. The moral law stands forever. When God gives the Ten Commandments, what is the reaction of the people? The people were afraid and trembled, and they stood afar off. Were they terrified of the law? Maybe. But what really seems to terrify them is being in the presence of God and actually hearing God speak. How do we react when we hear God? One thing about asking God questions and listening for his voice or being still and waiting on him is that when we hear him, we need to do what he says. We can't say, oh, that's a nice idea. Maybe that came from God. Maybe that was my own imagination. Thank you for your input, O creator of the universe, if that was really you. It doesn't work that way. The quickest way to stop hearing from God is to stop following his nudges. So, the people say to Moses, you speak to us, and we'll listen to you, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses says, do not be afraid. God wants to place the fear of him before your eyes, that you may not sin. Why does God want his people to be afraid of him? Well, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and these people are at the very beginning. God knows that they are at a very low level of moral and spiritual development, and he hopes that he can at least deter them from serious sin. While I was reading this passage, I thought way back to uh, those college classes in psychology, and specifically to Kohlberg's stages of moral development. Number one. Obedience and punishment. The question people ask themselves at this stage is, how can I avoid being punished? Number two, self-interest. What's in it for me? What do I get out of this if I do it? Number three, conformity. Be good, keep the social norms, don't rock the boat, get along. Number four, social order. Keep the law. Number five, social contract. Democracy. Law as the greatest good for the greatest number. Six, universal ethical principles. What is the right thing to do? Once our consciousness has been that trained. So, is this pyramid perfect? Eh, probably not. But is it useful? Yes. And it helps us understand how God relates with his people in the book of Exodus. God keeps trying to draw the people up to at least levels two, three, and four. Level two, promises of reward. He keeps promising them, you know, I will be with you. I will give you the promised land. I will make you a kingdom of priests. Level three, that's basically do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Get along with people. He's trying to draw them up to that level. 
Number four, the law. He gives them the law. Keep the law and you'll be fine. And finally, number six, the Ten Commandments, that goes beyond simply law. That's universal ethical principle. The Israelites aren't there yet. Most of them, again, the mob, the people that keep complaining all the time, they really seem to be at the most basic level of ethics, fear of punishment. This makes sense. They've been slaves. Their moral growth has been stunted. They've been taught all their lives, you do what the big guy says or you get punished. That's been the reality their whole lives. God is trying to talk to them in other ways, to bring them higher in their moral and spiritual development. But so often in the Israelites' journey through the wilderness, we're going to see God fall back on the only language most of them understand. Look, you got to do what the big guy says, or you'll be punished. Is this the way God wants to relate to us as his children? No. 